Hello and welcome to the launch of the Storm exhibition at the Bayart uh, Gallery in Cardiff. Um, today we have Phil Nicol and Maggie James from Bay Art Gallery and we also have members of the Deluge Collective to uh, talk to you about um, the pieces that we've produced. Um, going around the room we have um, Colin Hambrook on the left who is a spoken word poet um, we have Emily Earl next to me uh, she's a violinist um, myself my name is Freddie Myers I am a composer and I'm also a videographer um, next to me is Jeremy Hawkes he's an artist and he's based in Australia um, and I think it's very late for him right now so we're very very happy that he's joining us um, below me is Rachel Gadsden who is a visual artist um, and then we have Phil and Maggie at the bottom um, uh, if you um, want to check out the virtual exhibition, there will be links down in the uh, description box of this video. Um, and uh, but please stick around and, and watch this live discussion, and then go and have a look at the the whole gallery. Um, just for your diaries, on the thirteenth of May at four thirty, there will be an in conversation with Ruth Fabby from Disability Arts Cymru. Um, and uh, we'd love you to join us there as well. Um, if you have any questions um, throughout any of this conversation, um, do write those down in the YouTube chat box. That will be over that way, I think. Um, uh, if you have a YouTube account, you should be able to write uh, questions in the chat um, and we'll try and get to those if we see anything. Um, uh, on that note, I am going to hand over to um, Maggie from Bay Art. She's just going to talk a little bit more about um, the gallery and their association with Rachel Gadsden. Hi there. So um, I'm an artist and I work for um, Bay Art Gallery in Cardiff Bay. Um, we're based in a large studio complex, 16 studios, a gallery, and we're in a large grade two listed Victorian building in Cardiff Bay. Um, we're an artist-led gallery, so we're really, we understand the work that we're showing, the paintings and the sculptures, and we're not led by a market and we, we don't have overriding institutional issues that we have to adhere to. We make it up as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, we've been running since 2002, so, and this year we've had to really think about how are we going to um, get our art across? Because we've, you know, there are so many challenges with COVID-19. And with Rachel's show, we really wanted to find a way to, to show her work. And we've um, produced a microsite. And Phil and Rachel will talk about this, about how are we going to um, get our art across? Because oh, OK. There's a slight delay there. But um, OK. Um, um, yes, I <laughs> I don't know whether I'll be able to talk about the site because I'm a complete naive person as far as that goes, but it looks great. Um, we, we first came across Rachel when she kindly came down to open a show a few years ago uh, that we'd organised with six artists with um, Disability Arts Cymru. Um, okay, she um, was, yes, I... <laughs> um, be able to talk about the site because I'm a complete naive person. Okay, I'm getting sort of feedback here, so this is a bit odd, but um, uh, I'll carry on. Um, we, we talked to Rachel and we looked at her work. Uh, the Bay Art Gallery is, um, has always promoted art to do with a sense of objectness, um, a kind of, um, that, that has a strong leaning towards the, ha the haptic, that is maybe sensorial as opposed to uh, or, 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 or not just conceptual. Um, and certainly, Rachel's work seemed to fit what uh, our philosophy is, and uh, we, we were very uh, pleased to invite her to show. Uh, of course, since that original inv invitation, the whole COVID thing has come up, and all of the strengths that we wanted to uh, demonstrate with Rachel's work, her, um, her muscularity, her physicalness, her, her urgency in terms of mark-making, uh, all of those things that we thought we'd get from seeing it in situ uh, is obviously not going to happen. Uh, but we've got this site, and um, I think it's pretty good that it gets across some of the uh, some of the kind of elan of uh, of Rachel's work, actually. So I hope she's happy about it. Um, I most definitely am. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. Good. Good. Um, I mean, I wanted to just say a couple of things about the, the, the storm work, because I think, Rachel, you could maybe introduce more about the, uh, 
uh, the collective and, and the, the philosophy of, of, of how your work um, uh, goes on with, with, the, with the collective itself. And I, I think that um, the stonework is interesting. I mean, obviously, it's about the body. Um, your, your work is obviously, that's a central kind of theme, the central kind of tenet of it. Um, and although there's a kind of, um, it's about anxiety and isolation, and it seems to fit in terms of the kind of milieu that we're in, um, it also, in terms of the, um, and I, I think is what I like about it, in terms of its, uh, how, you, how you enact it, um, it has a kind of inclusivity. I mean, it, uh, it, it draws people in as well as kind of draw, draws out what's, what's coming from you. Um, and I, I think that's a that's a real strength, and I I think the work is looking really really good. Also, in terms of the, thank uh, you very much. Uh, it, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I think it was about maybe sixteen months ago that I received Phil and Maggie's email inviting me to be part of the Bay Art uh, Gallery exhibition last year. Strength. And in fact, I was in a hospital and I just had quite major spinal cord surgery. So it was a massive boost to find out that I would be showing with the gallery this year. But of course, since then, a lot of other things have happened. And the exhibition I thought I might show has changed quite dramatically, even recently, because we weren't sure whether we'd be able to go live as a proper exhibition in the gallery or whether it would be an online exhibition. But it was sort of at the beginning of January 2020, that I began to have uh, regular antibody treatments because I'd found out that I have no antibodies. And probably like the rest of the world, most of us had never really thought much about antibodies until we now all realize we want lots of COVID antibodies. And at that time I came across this quite extraordinary quote um, or a, a, a quote from uh, Kafka on the shore by uh, Murakami. I, I love Murakami's work and when I'm looking for titles I often look up his quotes to see if I can find anything that resonates with a painting I might have produced and this is the quote that really has made the work and the exhibition be what it is and I'm just going to read it it's actually on the website that you'll be able to read but I'm going to read it out now and the quote says and once the storm is over you won't remember how you made it through how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over, but one thing is for certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm is all about. And as we saw the pandemic enfold and, and wrap around us, all of our lives changed. They've changed now. This is our launch for our exhibition and we're sat in front of a computer. But having said that, it also means that we're actually part of a much bigger global audience. And I'm very grateful to Phil and Maggie who have purposely created a digital site which was created by Taylor Morgan for the gallery. And I think it really shows off my work very well. And I think you've captured something through the presentation that I really wanted you to. So I'm very grateful to you for doing that. Well, we're happy to do it. And of course, the, it also um, it also is is a great opportunity to see all of the kind of moving imagery that's in the uh, with with sound that's on on the website too. Um, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the collective? Yes, I, I would like to. And I think it's been quite an important thing. I, I've always dreamed of having a collective. I don't really know why, but I'm naturally somebody who does enjoy people. My work's about people. It's about the human condition. And I often think if it's only about me, then it's, it's too subjective. So I've always reached out to other people to find out and talk about other people within my work as well. And um, when I first went down to... Uh, Bay Arts uh, a couple of years ago, I did know about this collective, this collective of artists that were in shared studios. And often I don't have a shared studio or I'm in my own studio here in London because of my health situation and it's just practical. But I love the idea of being able to talk to other people and to share share what, what we're making our work, work about. I worked with Freddie Myers, 
um, in the past. And Colin Hambrook and I have had a very long relationship um, through disability arts. And then out of the blue, two years ago, Jeremy Hawkes sent me an email. And uh, I'll hand you over to Jeremy because he can say a little bit about how we met and how our relationships developed. Yeah, I still can't believe that you um, responded so kindly. Um, uh, an opportunity came up in Australia. The Australia Council for the Arts awarded a number of uh, mentorships, they were calling them, for artists with disability. And um, I've been casting about for a collaborator or a mentor or a teacher for a number of years. And a, a mutual friend suggested Rachel. And when I looked her up, I went, oh, I know this work. I know, I know this artist. I've seen this for years. There's a real similarity. Um, so... I felt a little bit like a stalker, but I just sent her an email introducing myself, sending her some work and saying, I'm going for this award. Would you like to work with me if I get it? And less than a year later, um, strangely enough, I was in New York City on my way to Europe and Rachel was on her way to Australia. So we passed each other somewhere in the Atlantic, but we got this opportunity to work together and it's, it's been going on from there. It's been incredibly fruitful because just as I realised I couldn't go and have these chats and coffees and interactions with people, there was Jeremy on Zoom. And we've actually spent the last year having we often weekly sort of in-studio conversations looking at our work and discussing about what we wanted to do with the work. Now, let's just get this straight. I am not Jeremy's right. <laughs> it's sort of an ongoing joke at the moment because the application requested a mentor. And I said, I'd be involved, but not as a mentor because I don't need to mentor Jeremy. Um, and we're very much collaborators. And uh, Jeremy said, I really want to do performance work. That's something I'd like to try and push my work in that direction. And I've never had the chance to work directly uh, with um, Emily Earle. And I'd also met another artist called Su Fung, uh, Su Fung Jung in Hong Kong, who I also wanted to work with, and we're going to introduce her shortly. And then also um, there was the opportunity to further develop the work um, that I'd started with Freddie Myers around performance and sound. Um, many of you know that I've lost a lot of my sight, and so sight, uh, so sound becomes quite a major part of the way I make my work. I hear sound when I'm actually creating. When I there was the old paint on the canvas, it has a language for me, um, much more of a visceral language rather than a, um, a sound language. No, so that we decided to join this collaborative group together. So finally, after about 30 years of wanting to be in a collective, we formed the Deluge Collective. And out of that, deluge our performance piece which is part of the exhibition is to be shown as well so freddie i don't know whether you'd like to say something with emily about how you've been working with colin um yeah i mean it's been a, a really can you put uh, that put your mic on yeah sorry we're just doing a bit of muting shuffling to stop some feedback things um trying to sort out these live streams is always such a, a delightful technical challenge but i think yeah um you know, as you can see from the captioning, we're trying to uh, trying to pull in live captions and things, which is always, you know, quite tricky, but an interesting technical challenge. Um, I feel like that sort of sums up all the all the all the work we're doing. It's always about this sort of cross media um, communication that sort of the challenge is the interesting thing. Um, so for, for as part of the exhibition, we've produced um, three graphic scores um, and this started um, I don't remember when it was, Rachel. It was uh, October time. I think we were doing some film work. And while we were, um, you know, I was able to, with COVID restrictions, go and um, do some filming in the studio with Rachel. Um, and we'd, we filmed a few panels. And then I said, why don't we just, like, do something for fun? Why don't we make a graphic score? Can you just... And I gave her some parameters. Can you draw a line, do four lines, and, and think about how you can change your gestures to correspond to the sounds that you sort of hear in your head when you're painting. Um, and Rachel just did this. And, and I then took it away and put it in front of Emily and said, this is a score that Rachel has made and I want you to, to, to create something. 
Um, and this is where the first one was born. Um, and it was so successful that then we um, got Jeremy um, to sort of create something and also Su Fung. And what's been really interesting is the sort of different ways in which the three artists have approached doing a graphic score. Um, and then how that sort of changes sonically. I mean, it's quite... Emily, can you talk to us a little bit about how you go about creating those sounds? Yes. Um, so with Rachel's... Uh, what's been really I sort of thought about... I was how to explain this. So with, yeah, with Rachel's, it was more about the... Sort of trying to interpret the sort of uh, yeah, feeling of, you know, charcoal, I think it was charcoal, on, on the paper and kind of recreating that texture as well as the sound on the violin. So all of it is, I mean, it's not melodic, it's not sort of tonal, it's all effects, essentially. Um, so it's sort of, um, yeah, trying to trying to embrace the, the gestures and the feeling of those things and then creating that in the violin. Um, and then with Jeremy's, it was a similar approach but we we discussed trying to look at it as if it were a musical stave and having sort of following the directions as if they were actual notes i drew some lines on the on on the on the yeah. video didn't i as it was going along so you yeah, could see a sort of a, a stave. Upper line and, yeah. and a lower line and, and trying to navigate between those two so that's why there's a lot more sort of there's you know like, there's sort of tumbling motions and things like that that mm. you get in that and then sufong's um because she's using um, calligraphy brushes, um, it automatically felt a little bit more melodic and lyrical. And actually, that one starts off. I'm playing the viola, um, naturally a more lyrical instrument. <laughs> I'll let the the, the violists hear that. Um, and then later on, because she uses colour, she introduces green, and then there's red. Um, those bits I've incorporated the violin again just as a kind of completely yeah. different well quite literally a different color um as a sort of different world um yeah so yeah they've been really interesting just to see the the differences and i think there's something that um each one of us as artists is very aware of in our own individual ways uh i think we're all really aware of our own psychological and physical fragility and I think it's something that has really come to the core in the last year for everyone. Most of us have just got on with our lives, but actually we've all shifted very aware of through, through the COVID situation. And I know having worked with Colin Hambrook quite a lot in the past, we've been very aware of that fragility and we've talked about it quite a lot. And because I specifically, most of us try and embrace but the actually, notions of how we work together um, as disabled people and how we understand language, whether it's a visual language or whether it's a, a, a physical or a sound language or whether it's a performance language, uh, that it's really important to try and capture all of those elements from an aesthetic point of view. And Phil and Maggie, I know this is something that's very important to you as gallerists and, and curators, that really what we're interested in is the aesthetic of the work. Yeah. And Colin, being a spoken word poet, seemed to be the exact right person to bring it on board into the piece to add another dimension to the work. And Colin, you came slightly later to the Deluge performance because we'd already done one play iteration of the work. And then we handed that over to you and maybe you can say something about how you joined the journey. Um, I think we've got Can you, you uh, muted there, Colin, because we've got some feedback things, but when you're speaking, it should be okay. Yeah. Um, to the deluge performance. Uh, done well, it, you know, it was wonderful to um, and then we handed that kind of help you, and maybe you can start the journey in my role as uh, editor of Disability Arts Online. And we, we put a, a small bit of seed money in, into the project um, um, in our... Um, uh, first uh, iteration of COVID commissions back when the uh, crisis hit last 
March 2020. And so when we ran um, a small bit of seed money, the kind of pub broadcast the, fir the first iteration of, 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 of Deluge and I was really interested in, in you know, the collective kind of developing and um, so, I, you know, I had quite a, a lot of conversations with Rachel about um, an element that I felt was missing being, being um, audio description um, and I, I've always been collective interested in the idea of, of and, uh, a creative description so I, you know, I had which is a, a, a way of providing about, um, um, an element that i felt was missing. an audio descriptive element being, being, to uh, to visual work um, but um, in a creative way in a poetic way and um a, a creative description so uh, uh, it was really enjoyable just kind of working with some of, of the the um the the, the imagery um, of the kind of first sets of anim animations and creating kind of sets of work, of poetic um, responses way, that i felt kind way. of um, and, um gave, gave a an, so, uh, an evocation really enjoyable of, just kind of working with some of the, the feelings the, um, and the the the, the sense of, the kind of, of, of what um, kind of what deluge of represented poetic, really and 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 looking to create this uh, new set set of work a, storm I, you know I, the, 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 the the kind of the imagery the of the, the of the elements the um, of is very kind of what, very um, intrinsic to to the work and to what we're and, and what we're looking to to do create to create a kind of um storm, in a way it's uh, kind of it's a document of what the, the, kind of the world has kind of been of going the, through the with 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 the crisis um, and um is very kind of what um, to, to the so it represents the kind of the isolation, but also the sense of hope in um, how we how we can adapt and how we can um, kind of evolve to keep connection and to 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 to, to, um, to, to, to gain resilience. So it's been really interesting for me to um, to work with this text as as a sort of sound designer. I mean, uh, the, the process of, of putting the, the Deluge performance together, which we're going to show um, later on in the stream, um, was a really fascinating one because, of course, we got this recorded text from Colin from the first sort of work in progress that we produced for, for Dow. Um, and then I sort of went to town with it and took apart bits and bobs, um, pulled apart some words, changed the cadence. But, but it's sort of the whole of this new piece emerged from this text, which sort of functions as an audio description, as well as being a poetic text. And, and that really, really intrigued me this way that sort of there's a circularity with imagery and that I might have taken your words that were describing one thing. And actually we did this um, with Rachel and I said, take this text from Colin, make something new that he said. And so we've got this sort of, rather than the words describing the visuals as an accessibility thing, we're now actually having this accessibility thing being described by Rachel who's painting and then I'm then capturing that back inside. So we've got this sort of really interesting dialogue with the ways in which we make our art um, be able to be understood by, um, by, by a very accessible audience. Um, yeah. I, I've got a question. Um, I, I think there, there is something that runs through most of the work, and uh, you could call it theatrical or performative, I suppose. Um, but but when I looked at, uh, I don't know Jeremy's work overall, but when the, the work in, in that's in Storm, the kind of biomorphic, kind of emblematic, very intense little, little things that are, have a very different kind of feel to it. So how did you feel if that is your normal way of working, and forgive me if it's not, I, I, I'm misrepresenting you. Um, how did you feel doing the kind of sound, you know, the kind of score thing? Because that seems to be you're in a different world there. 
Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Um, I won't bore you with the history of my artwork, but I have done things vaguely in that line, but oh. these were definitely new work. Um, okay. And it was sort of based... Um, uh, I, I was diagnosed some years ago with Parkinson's disease. Um, not sure if I do have it, but I have some sort of movement disorder. When I go off my medication, my work becomes really gestural. So there's a lot of involuntary movement. And um, when it first started happening, it was terrifying. And then I realised that it was actually a really good thing to unleash every now and then and, and to work that way. So I've always liked switching between the two of these really sort of quite tightly wound microscopic drawings. Yeah. And then switching it to that that sort of gestural work you saw in the score. Um, I had so many goes at doing that score too because I kept thinking of Emily and how she would respond to it and as a violinist and that kind of movement. So I I tried so many different ways. And then, of course, um, initially I went back to the very first one I did, which I think was the best one. Um, okay. But I felt a little bit sorry for Emily trying to interpret it. You made something that was of, very yeah. tricky. You don't want to see my logic file and how many takes we had. Um, but it was, I, th I, I mean, as a composer, I found that process really exciting. The sort of take this thing that has incredible amounts of detail in a tiny space of time and then try and realise that somehow. I mean, there, I think there was a sort of, um, for those of you who aren't musical, there's a, a sort of, school of composition called neo-complexity um, that really thinks about these ideas of incredible precision as a way of getting to the heart of sort of performance practice and there was a real element of that in in, in jeremy's video where you were very very precise like what was interesting is this dialogue between the precision of playing exactly what's going on and then the fact that you can't possibly do that and then the fact that it's completely improvised as well i think that's that was a really fascinating yeah if you look at the two files having done Rachel's and then Jeremy's. Um, <laughs> Rachel's, I, I started off trying to sort of ish plan it. Um, and then after the, it, it's, it's sort of four lines long. So once I got to the end of the first line, we actually just went and I Im improvised the rest, um, which was very liberating and not something I do a lot of. So that was, that was brilliant. Um, but so then we have this one long take of Rachel's which is what it ended up being but Jeremy's is lots and lots of little tiny bits and like, no stop stop I have to you know <laughs> do that bit do that bit <laughs> but it's a, I think it's a really because um when you're dealing with sound you, you sort of have the very literal to the very metaphorical and whenever you're dealing with this transcription process between music and art you're always dealing with metaphor of some sort um but of course it's really I think it's fascinating how these these three different schools have dealt with that very differently. And Jeremy's is incredibly precise, whereas Su Feng's is incredibly metaphorical. And, and there's sort of an atmosphere and a reference um, and, and a sort of colours that are being brought on, much more than this stroke is doing this motion and I am capturing that exact thing. Mm -hmm. Also, she doesn't, she doesn't conform to the... Um... To the, to the linear kind of dur durational kind of thing, does she? It's kind of more landscape as mm -hmm. we talked yesterday, I think about that. It does It does have a, um, Su Fong's obviously, she um, spent her formative years in China before moving to Hong Kong. And for me, when I watch it, and particularly in the Deluge film, I think it's very interesting because obviously maybe everybody who's here expected to see a launch and we are going to show you the film shortly but um just to give you some insight um there's maybe about 40 or so artworks in the exhibition and uh or there's there's 21 sections but there are series so then it multiplies the artworks and then there's also the three graphic scores and then there's also the performance that you'll be able to watch online afterwards, again, if you wish to. What we actually found when we were all making the work, uh, and I certainly felt, you know, I'm not a musician, but I understand an awful lot more about how music might work if I were to be a musician. I think I feel that our practices have fused, to, fused together and you see that most evidently within the bigger deluge piece. And the other thing that really interests me is the fact that, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy and I have never met in person. And yet I would probably say he's the closest 
collaborator I've ever worked with and the intensity of the work, which through all this distance stuff in our newfound world, we've actually found a way to work where it doesn't really matter where we are from now on, but we can still remain creative. And I think for many people through, specifically because musicians have not been able to play, they've done no concerts or very few concerts. Many artists like myself aren't showing our work in the way we may normally show the work. So there's been something incredibly empowering to actually be able to find a platform where we can actually come together as creatives and have dialogues and actually not just dialogues like we're having now on Zoom, but actually have dialogues where we're in the studio creating together. And I haven't felt that there's been a barrier at all because we found a way to work. It would be a bit easier I sometimes. Think it's quite exciting Thank as well, you. though, because um, mm. I think when you're all in the same space, often when you're collaborating, people's ideas of what a thing is going to be can sometimes conflict and that can cause, I mean, that conflict can be really interesting. But what's been really exciting about this is that everything that we've made, someone's had to go, right, this is the thing I'm giving you. And now it's in your hands and you have to do with that as you want and and sort of surrender um, authority, which I think you don't necessarily always get in art collaborations. And the fact that we haven't. I was just thinking about this other than Rachel, I haven't met any of you in real life and I, I didn't even really <laughs> hadn't, hadn't even thought about that. Um, on that note, um, we do have a little video from from Su Fung, and she she isn't with us. Um, I think she might even be watching at the moment, but she wasn't able to. Hi, Su Fung, if you're there, we should, we're missing you. I, but I think for the rest of you, we should just introduce her. So I'm just going to play play you all a little interview from. Um, I think this was back done back in November or December, um, but just talking about her and some things about her artwork. I was going to do that, but it doesn't seem to want to be playing for a second. So if you want to talk about something else and I'll work out what's going on there. I uh, have a question. Don't we love live technology? Isn't it wonderful? Um, yes, Maggie. So I'm very interested in your collaboration and I just wonder how it works. So you're both in your studios. I mean, are you um, making one piece of work and you're making another Jeremy how do you what is the collaboration how do you share how how does it actually work it's, well, I suppose there are lots of ways that you share the work but you know I'm I'm just looking for tactics really um, um well I, I suppose the the main thing is it's that conversation and how we're both completely engaged with each other's work and and the thing that also we're both disabled people and we both have quite similar, although very different disabilities, but they manifest themselves psychologically in quite a similar way. And I think that what we found, or I say for myself, but so powerful is the fact that although we make very different work, we know that there's a huge sense of, um, there's a parallel between what we're trying to do, even though it manifests itself slightly differently. Ideally, we would be working on the same piece together. And that may well happen. That might be our next element where we're actually going to be sending things backwards and forwards. But through the film, we certainly feel that we've worked together where we are, that you'll see within the film elements where my my piece comes, my piece I'm very closely intertwined with Jeremy's, but I don't know what you feel, Jeremy, about all of this. How do you feel? That's interesting. Um, I was thinking about it before, how this over, it's been over, over a year, year and a half since we first didn't meet, as it were, <laughs> um, that there's a few different streams that we have these regular catch-ups and we'll often just be holding the work up to the screen and going, what about this? Or we'll send things in drop boxes. We, have, we share a lot of the same references. We're both really big Francis Bacon fans. And so we'll have conversations and I'll be saying, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, um, based on the figure of Chris Fiction, you know, the 63 version, Rachel, the will know what I mean. So we've developed that shared language too. So we, we have these big, we're both big talkers too. We can be on Zoom for hours. Um, 
talking about favourite artists and paintings and things like that. And then I think just that backwards and forwards with Dropbox, I'll go back and refer to some of Rachel's specific paintings I'm looking at. So I guess in that way it's... Um, and, and the materiality, we're often talking about, you know, what are you working mm, with? What yeah. am I working with? Um, it, it, strangely enough, although I've been with so few artists this year in person, I feel the last 16 months has been probably one of the most creative times of my life. And people know I'm quite prolific anyway, but actually this year, I just sort of feel I've become what maybe what I've wanted to be for a very long time. Um, maybe I am a her hermit really and just like making but it's allowed I think for many artists and musicians maybe less so with musicians but composers we've all been able to take our work to another level which we might not have had time to we've got rid of all the things that busy our lives and we've had time to reflect in a much deeper way um, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking maybe we should show the film yeah. and certainly Deluge. Yeah. Uh, you will be able to go online, as I said, and see all the artworks and some of the artworks we've created are embedded within the film. But maybe now's a moment for you to just watch the current version of Deluge. Is that possible, Freddie? Great, let's do that. This multimedia piece is conceived as a unified audiovisual work. As such, the audio translates what can be seen into sound, while the visuals provide a realisation of the music. Scritch, scratch. Electric God hands writes a signature across our DNA. Transparent blue flash scribbling an answer to this isolation. Blank, black. The corner of a room emerges, a runway, a figure setting itself into this lonely space. Palms across the water, dreams in reverse. Scritch, scratch, an electric signature. Bone translucent hands writhing to write a conscious breath into being, searching for a name. An intense face and torso inverted, a stark blue hair, wild eyes piercing through this confinement, building white electricity. Marks stretched across time, elastic screech. We choose, but do not choose. We take the physicality of our mark and render it. Scratch, scritch, 
our hearts hang strange fruit alone. Desolation brown, arms across the canvas. If we could see this time from a long way off, would it reveal something inevitable? Hands defining visceral marks. Desolation brown. Cells in motion. A virus mutates. A virus mutates. A virus mutates. Two parallels, creative stories, torn tree blowing. Dripping in a wind of paisley pattern blue, emerging, fading to a light bulb tree, the light of cognizance, a strange fruit undulating, beautiful and deadly, unstill, evolving. drawing white paint circles. We choose, but do not choose. We take the physicality of our mark and render it. We recognize ourselves grasping for meaning, pulsing figures.
everything. To feel this liveness. A cord reaching to eternity. And still these figures move into focus, inevitable. A wheel turns, a scorching fluctuation of forms in love. If we could see this time from a long way off, would it reveal something inevitable? We choose, but do not choose. We take the physicality of our mark and render it. Scratch, scritch, our hearts hang alone. Cave figures delineated. Cave figures delineated. Cave. destructive fire. A prayer to our ancestors speaking themselves through hands desperate. Searching for nucleus, a heart remote hanging from a tree the human tree, cave figures delineated, a prayer to our ancestors, speaking themselves through hands desperate. Our ancestors, speaking themselves through hands A monstrous golden form burning like some ashen forest. Death's Head Farmyard Beast. A Death's Head Farmyard Beast and these hands that called it all into being, scraping across the canvas, visceral and alive. Visceral and alive.
and alive. Scraping across the canvas, visceral and alive. So I hope you enjoyed uh, seeing the deluge performance. You can go back and obviously if you need to, for whatever reason, have a look at it through the website. But what I did uh, want to do was to introduce you to Su Fung, because as you see, she plays quite a major part in our work as well and is um, a very important part of our collective. So if we could just introduce you to Su Fung as she's not here, um, that would be I think some of that worked, at least. Um, sorry, we're having having some tech problems here. But, uh, so, you... um, yeah. so, as... as um, we said we're carrying on working as a collective. The exhibition will be at uh, Bay Art till the 14th of May. On the micro site. On the micro site. Um, uh, the link. Find in the description down below, there's a link to it. And if you have any thoughts, uh, please share them with us through social media or also um, directly to the gallery. Uh, we'd love to know what you think about the work. Uh, it's up to you to see it. Um, and certainly, if you'd like to share the work with anybody else, we'd be really grateful for you to do that. Um, and we're very grateful that you've us, been here today. If you, want, if you want to support the Deluge Collective, um, there is a subscribe button down there on YouTube. If you have a YouTube account, do subscribe. Um, we have an Instagram as well. It's uh, down the bottom of the description. Um, and you can also find links to Bay Art Gallery and uh, you'll be able to have a look at the exhibition, but also all the other wonderful stuff they do at Bay Art. Um, yeah, I highly recommend uh, artists, especially artists who um, are similar to all of us that want to be collaborating with the gallery. I can't recommend uh, Bay Art uh, more. It's been a, a really pleasurable experience to build this exhibition and to bring it together and and as I say, I, I really respect uh, the vision that uh, Maggie and Phil have in their own work, but also in the ideas that they bring for the curations of their particular exhibitions, which are truly inspirational. So well, likewise, Thank it's you. been quite amazing meeting you, Rachel, and the Deluge Collective. What a journey. We've learned so much on the way. <laughs> and learned a lot about technical things, which uh, yeah. for most of us who are just used to drawing and painting, it's been a big journey. And uh, we thank you for your patience today. And we hope we all meet again. Remember, there is another event on the 13th of May at four o'clock with Ruth uh, Fabby, where we'll carry on some of this conversation um, around issues of disability and creating art that has a voice through uh, disability arts. So um, 
thanks a million for being here today and for joining our presentation and launch. Thank you very yeah. much, everyone.